Okay, take it away. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Let me just resize this so that way I can still see you all. Um, thanks for having us uh, join today. Um, as Devin mentioned, we're from the California Digital Library. Um, just to give a brief uh, introduction of that, it provides transformative digital library services that are grounded in our partnerships with our 10 campuses of the University of California, as well as our affiliated research centers and external collaborators. Uh, we work together to amplify the impact that the library scholarship and resources of the University of California can have. And part of that is providing mechanisms for implementing UC's open access policies and coordinating uh, that implementation. And specifically, we're here to talk a bit more about UC's open access policies uh, and the presidential open access policy that expanded open access rights to all UC non-Senate staff. UC's policies cover all UC employees and their work that they have authored whilst employed at UC. That's nearly a quarter of a million people. To our knowledge, more, any, uh, more authors than any other institutional open access policy in the world. And if not, oh, let us know if that's the case. We largely have three open access policies, the UCSF, San Francisco Academic Senate, and system-wide Academic Senate open access policy, which cover Academic Senate faculty across the UC and their scholarly articles. They were passed in 2002 and 2013. Following on was the UC presidential open access policy, which was adopted in 2015, covering all UC employees. In terms of numbers, the Senate open access policies cover around 22,000 people across UC's 10 campuses, and the presidential open access policy covers the remaining 207,000 uh, UC employees. Um, it's a bit difficult to say how many of that quarter of a million people are actually authoring scholarly articles uh, that are covered by the still doing introductory kind of stuff right now. Policies. <laughs> um, but we would say that it's about 60 to 70,000. And a question that we're often asked is who's covered by what? Senate faculty are those who are represented by the academic Senate and they include people with titles like professor, dean, chairs and the like. Uh, employees are everyone else. They're like me, Katie, Catherine, uh, some of our other UC colleagues who are here on the call today, I believe, are also uh, falling under the presidential open access policy. They go as well to people such as uh, residents, uh, health sciences clinical professors, and uh, graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, and the like. And let me turn to Katie for more on how the policy came about. So um, our Senate policies, the UCSF one and the system-wide one, um, were adopted in the way that you're used to seeing these policies adopted. You know, there's a, a representative self-governing body of the Senate, uh, and they vote to impose it upon themselves. There is no such body for everybody else, right? Um, so you would have to have the postdocs maybe adopt it for themselves, the grad students, et cetera, et cetera. The only way we have for uh, a policy that implies across the system to all employees is to get it passed as a university policy that goes through system-wide review and people submit comments and it goes through management consultation and through the policy advisory committee and is eventually issued by the president. Um, so that is the whole separate process um, that that had to go through. Uh, I'm gonna ask Catherine to say a little bit more about like really how did this happen um, over time? Thanks, Katie. So uh, when the Senate policy, the system-wide Senate policy was adopted, there was a, an interest immediately in, uh, in thinking about how to expand coverage of the open access policies that you see, particularly because our faculty champion who was really pushing and was then the chair of the, uh, the committee, the academic Senate committee that, that was doing most of the work around the policy, um, uh, is a faculty member at UCSF and UCSF is a medical campus that has a great many researchers who are not Senate faculty. In fact, he argued that nearly 50% of the folks who were creating, you know, doing the research, <clears throat> creating these publications 
would not be covered by the Senate policy. And so he made it clear that, you know, he felt like the next step for the institution was to think more broadly about how to cover those folks as well. Um, as a result, a uh, provostial committee was created with representatives from um, the Office of the President and the faculty and the libraries. And we worked together to fashion a, uh, a policy that was uh, nearly identical to the Senate policy but would be uh, applicable to employees. And, um, and as Katie described, there was a, an elaborate sort of um, vetting process, uh, an opportunity for the community to provide feedback uh, before that policy was uh, decreed officially. Um, and the policy lives within the Office of the President um, as opposed to the, uh, the Senate. And, um, and that's an important distinction because we originally as an institution around 2007 um, attempted to adopt an open access policy even before Harvard. Um, and we failed at it because it was coming from the office of the president um, and the faculty felt uncomfortable uh, with it. So we had to retool and find a way to make this more of a grassroots effort on the part of the faculty to succeed in adopting a Senate policy but we found that once that policy was in place, once we had the UCSF policy, the initial one, which gave rise to and made more comfortable the larger system, system-wide policy for the, the academic Senate, we were then in a position to come back as the office of the president and, and create a, 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 a university-wide policy um, without the same kind of um, uh, suspicion and anxiety, I would say. Um, and it was a natural sort of evolution toward this larger, more comprehensive policy. Okay. Um, hey, is there anything else you wanted me to cover before we move? No, okay. that I think is a great perspective. Um, all right, so I'm gonna walk through a few of the ways in which our policies are just like what you might be used to and also a little bit quirky. Um, so all of them cover scholarly articles, uh, not books, not software, um, that's typical. What's a little bit unusual is um, our, go back one, um, our presidential policy, because it's a presidential policy and every presidential policy has this very structured format where you start out with your definitions and you end with your, you know, who's responsible for implementation. We do actually have a definition for scholarly articles in there. Um, I'll include a link to the language at the end, but it says uh, published research articles in the broadest sense of the term, a narrower term could have the effect of excluding works published in a certain format, discipline, or practice. For example, the term scholarly journal articles might exclude those who publish in edited volumes. The term peer-reviewed scholarly articles might ex exclude law reviews, which are reviewed by students or by editorial collectives. Um, and that's been a little bit helpful as people who answer questions uh, from authors. You know, what do you mean scholarly articles? Under the Senate policy, we always just said, well, if you considered a scholarly article, we considered a scholarly article, go ahead and include it. Um, and with the presidential policy, we started being able to send people this definition. Uh, next up. Uh, this, pretty normal. Uh, articles are covered for uh, whenever they have a publication agreement that was signed after the policy was issued and the person was uh, employed at UC. Next. Um, and for most of the time, they work the way that the standard model policy works. There's a non-exclusive license to the university uh, and those rights then survive um, any subsequent agreement that an author signs with a publisher. Um, and that is the case for uh, both the Senate OA policies and it is the case sometimes under the presidential open access policy because some people covered by that policy own their copyright under UC's copyright policy, um, but some of them don't. So next slide. Um, for some of our authors under the 1992 copyright ownership policy, which is soon to be revised, um, we have folks who are writing scholarly articles but don't own their own copyright. The university owns it. Um, the university cannot give a license to itself. The authors cannot license to the university what they don't have. Um, so instead, the policy says that um, the university just retains the rights. Um, and that's how that works. Uh, next up. Uh, waivers also work a little bit differently. So um, one of the ways that they're different is the UCSF's policy and the presidential policy have um, the requirement that's standard in a lot of policies where even if you get a waiver, you're still expected to deposit for the purpose of building that um, 
record of the university scholarship. Uh, our system-wide Senate folks decided they didn't care so much about building that uh, collection that nobody was gonna look at. They really just cared about making more stuff open. So they removed that requirement. Um, moving on to talk a little more about publishers. We did a lot of outreach. I say we, uh, I wasn't involved. Other folks at CDL uh, sent emails to over a hundred publishers in 2013, around the time that the system-wide Senate policy came out. Um, the responses we got from publishers, um, there weren't very many. They often reflected misunderstandings on the part of publishers. Uh, I would say they just, uh, a common thing was that they were just conflating gold and green. They're like, that's nice, you have an open access policy. Here is our hybrid open access policy and fees. Um, but that wasn't most of them. And then on the other end of the scale, we have um, publishers who've been a lot more friendly towards author rights. Uh, the list here includes publishers where um, our licensing group has gotten uh, a provision in our content license with those publishers that acknowledges author rights and may even call out the open access policy specifically. All the language is different in every agreement. Uh, next. So waivers, uh, they opt out of the open access policy for a particular article. Um, this is a pretty normal thing to have in an open access policy, um, but ours work a little different between the two policies. Um, next slide. So uh, Senate faculty can go to a web form that we have on the Office of Scholarly Communication site. They fill it out, they get a waiver letter, um, and they send it to their publisher. And uh, next slide. Uh, those non-Senate employees who hold copyright in their articles do the exact same thing. The form is there, they use it, um, they get a waiver for any article they want for whatever reason they want because their publisher has asked them to because they hate the open access policy. I don't know that that's ever happened, but um, we don't ask. They are free to exercise their uh, academic freedom to do what they like. Um, next. However, um, the university thought that um, as long as it owns the copyright, they should make a point of being a little tougher on just letting folks opt out. And so there's language in the presidential policy um, that if you're telling the university to waive their rights, um, because you don't own the copyright in the article, you are supposed to show compelling circumstances to opt out. Um, I think the main compelling circumstance would be if your publisher has told you they won't publisher, publish you unless you get a waiver. Um, and there is a list of contacts, one at each campus, who you're supposed to contact to say, um, you know, I have this reason and I would like to uh, have a waiver for this article, even though I don't own my own copyright. Um, it is not clear that people understand this distinction. Um, I think most of our authors believe they own copyright in their article, or at least they've always acted as though they do. Um, and everyone can use the form. We just have this bold face type at the top that says, if you don't own your copyright, you're supposed to show compelling circumstances first. Um, and I don't actually know how many uh, questions those folks who are supposed to get the, uh, get the compelling circumstances shown to them actually get. I suspect it's a low number. Um, and the next slide lights that up a little bit. So um, we do get waiver requests, but they're a really small number compared to what you see as publishing. So let's see, um, these graphs were updated as of November, 2020. So for last four years, the last year's worth of data we have, these are like just three month chunks so since the OI policy, the system-wide one was passed. Um, there were 292 waivers granted across the entire UC system. 300 waivers. Remember, we've got like 25,000 just faculty and probably, I don't know, 40 or 50,000 people publishing. Um, so that's a very tiny number. We also had about 38,000 articles uh, deposited in that time. So a few hundred waivers. Um, and by the way, 90% of those waivers um, came from nature journals. So uh, it used to be we'd also have a big chunk or a, a noticeable chunk from AAAS or from PNAS, um, IOP. Now it's really just nature. Um, and also they're really only remembering to ask, ask folks from UCSF. Um, I would say it's pretty hard looking at this graph to guess when the presidential open access policy was passed, right? If, if publishers knew that there was a bunch of new authors, you would think that the graph would be kind of flat-ish and then go up and stay there. Um, it doesn't. It was actually Q8 or Q9, according to the terminology here, when, when the new policy came out and way more authors were covered. 
our waiver numbers have not been substantially higher. Um, and I think that that is because um, the publishers, mostly Nature, um, and the authors weren't sure who was covered in the first place. Like we had grad students and postdocs, I think, requesting waivers back before they needed one because they weren't covered by the policy. Um, but now everybody who thinks they're covered actually is, um, and some of them get waivers, but a really small percentage um, and generally just folks publishing uh, in Nature journals. Next slide. All right, so in a nutshell, to sum up our policies and their, uh, their likenesses and differences, our UCSF policy looks almost exactly like the model policy language that's out there. Um, System-wide Senate policy mixes it up a little bit. Um, it doesn't require a dark deposit with a waiver, and it takes out that uh, non-commercial provision, provided that the articles aren't sold. The presidential policy borrows a lot of that language but mixes it up in a completely different order and has to add this thing about what to do if the author doesn't add copyright. So it's kind of a unique critter on its own. Uh, and so I put a bit.ly link in there so you can see all of that language yourself. I think that's it, thanks. Thanks, Katie. And so here we'll be going over how the policy is implemented, which I'm sure is also going to be very uh, similar to the how it's implemented at other uh, institutions with open access uh, policies. E-Scholarship serves as the institutional repository and pos uh, publishing platform for the University of California's 10 campuses and affiliated research centers, and it's where researchers can participate in UC's open access policies by waking, making their work available to everyone. Uh, the open access policies extend our public mission to share broadly the university's research and knowledge, um, not just with folk in California and in the US, but globally, our feeds are shared publicly and visitors worldwide access the UC's work via e-scholarship. Um, Part of the charge during the initial Senate open access policies was for the CDL to provide a platform to make participating in the OA policy as easy as possible. And participation is, of course, a big thing because for us, we have so many people, it's largely user driven. The users themselves, the researchers, are the ones who are verifying their publications and are uploading them to e scholarship. So we do this with the UC Publication Management System, a system-wide implementation of symplectic elements used solely for implementing the open access policies. It automates harvesting, verification, and upload. And this is just a very quick walkthrough of what that looks like for researchers. They receive a notification of anything that the system has found over the prior two weeks as new or pending upload. They log in using their campus credentials and then are presented with a list of items immediately once they uh, verify or claim an item they're brought to a deposit page which gives them very generic but uh, advice about which version of that article researcher uh, the researcher should deposit um, and of course we want that author's final version of the article and we very much are trying to get them to not publish the published version. Of course, they could in certain circumstances in the Sherpa Romeo advice um, that will be tailored to that specific publisher or journal is there for them to see as well. And then once they have uploaded the article, that's it. They're sent back to continue verification or in some cases, uh, you know, they're done there. They can also appoint delegates and the like. Um, they're people who are employed by UC in order to help them with that. Since the launch of the system and the adoption, or since the adoption of the open access policies and the launch of the system, there has been an increase, but especially with the launch of the system and the notifications telling the researchers, hey, we found something, please verify and deposit it. We have seen more deposits into uh, e-scholarship. And right now it's about 85, 86,000 um, articles have, that fall under UC's open access policies um, have been deposited into e-scholarship. At present, all Senate faculty across UC have access to the system and can verify and upload their publications. And in 
late 2019, two campuses, Irvine and Riverside, launched pilots of the presidential open access policy, giving all staff login access to the systems and a pilot group of researchers access to the publications harvesting deposits and notifications feature. We had hoped in 2020 that we could begin pilots of additional campuses. Um, however, COVID-19 did put a bit of a wrench into that. And for now, we've been working on the infrastructure behind the system and preparing our outreach resources and the like to ensure that once campuses are ready to launch their own pilots to the groups covered by the presidential open access policy, they'll just need to you know, flip a switch. And at the same time, we're looking for ways to make policy participation easier for researchers, such as automatically depositing works, which are already open access, for example, via our transformative, uh, transformative agreements or ones that they've made open access in PubMed and the like. For now, non senate employees can use eScholarship's own manual deposit form to upload their works. It's a similar process. They just find their campus, log in with their e-scholarship account, and then fill out a very simple form that requests limited metadata in order to reduce their input burden. Um, they can even add a DOI or PMID if they have it in order to autofill the data, attach the file, and add a CC reuse license or even an embargo, and they're done. And that's the basics of how the policies are implemented. Uh, just to give an overview of how people find out about the open access policies. These days, most users learn of UC's open access policies through these, the biweekly email notifications that they receive anytime the UC publication management system has found new items for them to verify or deposit into eScholarship. The first time, that they receive these notifications. For example, if they are new to UC as a Senate faculty or new as a part of a presidential policy pilot group, they'll receive a longer version with some welcome messages, uh, brief information about the system and pointing them to resources on their campus to get assistance with fulfilling UC's open access policies. When the policies were launched, um, at the Senate policy or Irvine and Riverside during the presidential open access policy pilots, um, there were announcements made usually for the Senate policy. These came from say the academic Senate, librarians, the research office. In the case of um, the presidential open access policies, these were largely coming from the library or if, um, if there were a particular department that the campuses were working with announcements at the department level. Um, the representatives on campus were making uh, presentations to faculty or at library events, um, as well as during open access week or launch week events, usually, um, for example, Irvine during their presidential open access policy pilot, they had uh, bundled it together with the 2019 open access week events. And campuses are also promoting the open access policy along with their other open research and um, open identifier initiatives. For example, if the campus is an ORCID member, they're bundling that up with um, communication about ORCID, about Dryad and open data sharing and the like. It's all a part of a whole um, for many campuses. And finally, uh, to speak a bit about how it is assessed um, for the regular assessment for campuses, there are regular and quarterly system activity reports, including those which can be generated from the system, as well as these monthly deposit activity reports at the campus level that can be accessed via eScholarship. And we're hoping as well to be providing uh, campus reporting dashboards across um, the full system of our team at CDL. And I'm going to turn to Catherine to talk about how it is reported at the higher level and assessed at the higher level, I should say. So uh, we had uh, some uh, reporting requirements when the, when the pilot implementation of the first system-wide Senate policy uh, began. So this, the Senate policy was adopted unanimously 
um, but also with some trepidation. And some of the faculty were concerned in particular, and this is a, a trope that we've heard throughout uh, the process, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, concerned that the policy would bring undue burden on them to comply, participate, um, and, uh, and our, our directive really was to find a way to implement the policy that was as, um, as simple for the faculty to participate in as possible. So we began with a pilot of, I think, three campuses and um, with the notion that we would report at both six months and 12 months on our progress and also um, do a survey of faculty to determine how they felt about the interactions with the system. Um, and those uh, reports uh, ended up being a little bit delayed as we implemented things, but we did do two reports um, reflecting the fact that things were going swimmingly, the faculty were fine, nobody had, had suffered, um, and, uh, and that actually allayed the fears of the Senate and they ceased to request reporting from us. Um, we don't have any formal reporting structure in place for the Senate policy. In some ways, this has been um, so sort of naturalized within the system that it's just seen as, a, you know, it's a given that we will be collecting these materials, that folks will participate. Um, we certainly don't have 100% participation by any stretch of the imagination, but we also don't have the level of anxiety and concern about the process that we had, you know, nine years ago. So, um, what we do now is, uh, you know, uh, watch the numbers, report on the numbers occasionally, um, just as an FYI, but there are no formal, uh, formal assessment or uh, reporting requirements associated with the policies at this point. Thank you, Catherine. And that brings us to the end of our presentation um, as we have prepared. So I'll stop sharing here and ask any questions. Thank 